but welcome, Disha. And it's interesting because uh, Patricia and I were holding a conversation with our listeners mm -hmm. about being a woman in the workforce and all of the stressors and having to deal with children and all of the things that we have to deal with as, as working moms. So it was interesting um, and, and certainly not lost in our audience <laughs> that, uh, that you had those same issues this morning. So, but we're just happy that you're with us. Likewise, thank you all for having me. So we're gonna jump in and um, Patricia, uh, we've been talking long here. So I think the audience knows you well enough. I would have normally introduced you, um, but I'm just gonna let you go ahead and introduce our guest. Yeah, and I am really excited that Disha was able to make it because when we had our initial conversation, I was blown away and I am confident that you're all going to be educated and enriched and inspired by listening to her talk. And so let me just read through her bio and then we will dive right into the interview. Um, and so Disha is an accomplished leader who shapes communication strategies, counsels CEOs, advocates for inclusion and grows teams. And she's a passionate driver of transformative initiatives that generate results whether targeting investors, analysts, consumers, employees, or community stakeholders. And Disha leads the Metro Atlanta Chamber's strategic focus on promoting Atlanta, and she's the organization's head of diversity and inclusion. And so her team spans across internal communications, traditional marketing, and the region's millennial and Gen Z targeted movement, Choose ATL. And she also leads the organization's inside out approach to advancing diversity, equity, and inclusion, including efforts that aim to drive collaboration and collective impact among the region's diversity and inclusion leaders. And in September 2020, Disha was appointed to the board of directors for skincare brand Urban Skin RX, and she's a proud alumna of Clark Atlanta University. So thank you so much for being here, Disha. Thank you for having me. I'm excited about the conversation, Patricia. <clears throat> Good. Well, I want to just dive right into the discussion because you've got a lot of really varied experiences and a really impressive career up to this point. Um, and so I just start, wanted to start with a really open-ended question, which is, you know, could you tell us about your story and, you know, how you've gotten to where you are today? Yes, happy to. I think when you and I spoke um, and you asked that question, I probably started talking about my parents. So um, I grew up between um, uh, Maryland outside of Washington, D.C. And, and the southern part of New Jersey. And um, my mom was a school teacher. My dad worked for F.W. Woolworth and ran retail stores for them. Um, way back in the day. So anybody who remembers F.W. Woolworth, um, well, you'll, you'll know that era. I'm a retail kid. Um, but my mother was very, um, I don't know, she was, my, my parents have passed, but my mom was very um, clear about what it took to really chart your path in life. And one of the things that, um, that she imparted on me very early was um, that it's important to know what you're really good at and, and try to find a way to do that, you know, for the rest of your life, but also like be clear on what it means to do that for the rest of your life, right? And so when I was in high school, I took a bunch of um, personality assessments and they always came back to say that I should go into public relations or um, psychology. My mother was like, I wanted to come to Atlanta to go to school and I needed to be able to tell her what I was going to do with my life before I was allowed to come to Atlanta. <laughs> and so I sat with all these career books. I mean, I can remember the day very vividly in the, in the public library. And I went back home and I told my mom, I've decided I'm going to be, <clears throat> I'm going to major in communications and I'm going to um, lead communications for some big corporation one day. Um, I stood on the, a stage in high school and said that in front of like hundreds of people and, um, and just, you know, have really been fortunate to, um, to not only have that clarity uh, very early, but also like enjoy getting to, you know, that objective and in, in, in my career and in my life, like I literally love what I do. And so um, I started my career at Ketchum doing um, 
public relations campaigns and strategy for um, big brands, Procter & Gamble brands, CoverGirl and Tampax, and um, worked with Delta Airlines very early in my career in the Home Depot. I ended up going to work for Earthlink, um, doing corporate communications for what was the second largest dial-up internet service provider wow. um, mm -hmm. at that point, right? Remember dial-up? <laughs> yeah, um, and then I decided to move to Arkansas to uh, <clears throat> do communications work inside of the largest company in the world, Walmart. Um, I was there for a decade before coming back to Atlanta and have been at the chamber now for, um, for about four, almost four and a half years. Um, and my role at the chamber is really about promoting Atlanta as a great place for talent and, a, and as a great place for business. And a part of that means um, that we need to lift up diversity, equity, and inclusion um, not only as a business imperative, but as a community imperative. And so I really have enjoyed doing this sort of trifecta marketing communications and DEI work um, during my time at the chamber. That's, that's amazing. And, you know, we've been hearing particularly over the past year so much more about DEI work, and that seemed to be more on the forefront for a lot of businesses. Um, so what kind of initiatives are you currently working on in that space? Yeah, so we, um, some of you all who are in Atlanta may have heard about this, but, um, <clears throat> you know, we were really excited to launch um, the ATL Action for Racial Equity um, this past February. And this was an initiative that um, we really began in earnest to think about last summer after the unfortunate death of George Floyd and Ahmaud Arbery and even Rayshard Brooks here in our own community in Atlanta. We had a number of companies, as you all know, who had been making statements. They had been talking to their employees, hosting courageous conversations, and really encouraging um, you know, leaders to go in, into this um, period of deep learning and listening. And, 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 but, but they got to a place, the CEOs who convened at the chamber, um, where they said, man, like we need to do something, right? Um, and we need to go beyond words, turn those into action. And, um, and they wanted to do it together. And so <clears throat> because the chamber is the place, our board, um, you know, we're really fortunate to have a lot of the CEOs of the large um, employers in our market who sit on our board and other leaders. Um, they, convene, they convene at the chamber. And so it just made sense for us to be the business organization that um, tried to get to some clarity around what it means to take action and take action together. And so that is what the ATL Action for Racial Equity is all about. We studied um, the data around inequity and systemic racism in our community. We, we looked at um, a number of issue areas and um, determined um, four issue areas that we believe business is most <clears throat> prepared to drive um, and accelerate change in. It's um, corporate policies, so in, and in particular, HR policies. Um, it's inclusive economic development, which is really about supplier diversity and elevating um, underrepresented businesses. It's education and workforce development. And the data also made clear for us that um, when, we, when we talk about racial inequity in Atlanta, when you really, really unpack it, um, our Black community is being disproportionately impacted and um, and so the initiative at this juncture is really focused on elevating Black talent and Black-owned businesses and using business strengths to do that. And so um, we've been really excited about this initiative. Um, it's it, it is um, it really is one of the the it is a it's probably the most proud thing that I've been able to do in my career um, simply because of the. Um, possibilities, the impact that it could have, not only for, you know, our business community, our community at large, but even, you know, for me, it's about my family, you know, I'm raising these beautiful Black boys, um, and I would love for them to be in a society that ha puts the wind behind them so that they can be um, everything that they were um, made to be, I believe. And so uh, this initiative is not one that will solve every problem, but I do believe that it can have um, tremendous impact. That's great. I mean, um, you know, my own sense is that it seems like businesses are much more sort of 
in this from a genuine space, whereas before a lot of DEI seemed to be just sort of a check of the box um, sort of thing that businesses have done. Has, has that been your experience as well? Yeah, I think yeah. that um, for us, we're really clear that in particular, as it relates to the racial equity work, that it's an economic imperative, right? Mm -hmm. Like we, we um, have really tough issues that we deal with deal with when it comes to inequity and immobility in Atlanta. Um, and, and at the end of the day, there just is a lot of talent left, you know, on the table. Um, and we can't sustain the growth of this region in terms of job growth and economic growth by simply bringing in talent from outside the market, mm -hmm. right? Like that is not a sustainable model. We have to also grow talent, um, upskill talent, and, um, and, and make sure that 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 the that the the community is sustaining the growth and also benefiting from the growth and so I say all of that uh, to answer your question, Patricia, because I think that yes, people are sincere, but I also believe that leaders see um, very clearly the business case and the economic case. Um, for focusing on this important work. And then the final thing I will say about, about uh, this topic is that um, the other piece that I think um, cre has created this uh, just rise in diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives and the, the, the greater importance um, that is being put on them from a business perspective is that, you know, the talent of the future, the customer of the future is um, Gen, Gen Z and millennials. And we all can, you can Google it and learn a, as much as you want about those two demographics. But the one thing that I will tell you is that they have very high expectations when it comes to leaders, um, businesses, brands, and even in our case, a place, right, as it relates to social issues. And it doesn't matter um, the, the political uh, mindset, right? It doesn't matter what, what, your, what political party you affiliate yourself with. Um, even when you look across political party affiliation, um, those two generations in particular, again, expect some, something very specific mm -hmm. from brands, companies, employers, and places as it relates to social issues. Yeah, absolutely. So you mentioned that, you know, this is one of the career accomplishments that you have been proudest of. Um, are there any other accomplishments you've had? You know, you've had a lot of different experiences that are you really proud of? Yeah, I, you know, I, I've Look, looked at that question last night. Um, and I think at the end of the day for me, when I when I think about the things that, um, you know, I hope that someone would say about me um, if I weren't in a room, um, if they were talking about how, how I made a mark, I really think and hope that it would be um, making a mark on individuals. So, so for me, um, you know, I get really excited and I'm very proud when people who have worked for me or alongside me or people who I've worked for call me up, right? And just say, hey, I wanna pick your brain on something um, or I wanna share with you something. I am working through a challenge and I want you to be my thought partner. Um, I think that that is the highest compliment. Um, and so for me, you know, the ability to um, to help solve problems together with a number of leaders, um, some who are sort of famous in the CEO <laughs> ranks, um, I won't name drop, but I've had you know some really great opportunities to help leaders solve problems, um, people from all sorts, all walks of life, and um, and the fact that they you know still call me friend and call me a colleague is the thing that um, makes me the most proud in my career. That's excellent. Um, you know, and I guess on the flip side from the accomplishments, uh, most people who have gotten to the point where you are in your career have definitely had some challenges that they've had to overcome. Um, and, you know, we were actually before you joined talking about how the past year has been challenging, but has maybe allowed people to uh, develop a lot of resilience. Um, but in your own experience, what have been some of the biggest challenges that you've overcome in your career? You know, I think that um, <clears throat> for me, my biggest challenges 
probably fit within a a a one topic area. I mean, it, it and it and it really does not to go back to diversity and inclusion, but it really does have to do with um, inclusion. At the end of the day, mm-hmm. I um, have found myself, you know, um, in the fortunate but also tough spot of often being the only black person around the table, mm-hmm. um, sometimes I'm the only woman around the table, um, oftentimes I'm the youngest person around the table. Um, which means I'm like the only person with, you know, young children and um, who has all of these different dimensions that come with, you know, how I show up. And so, um, and I'm very uh, intentional about bringing all those dimensions. I, I don't, I don't leave any of them, you know, at home when I arrive in the office. And so for me, I would say that my greatest challenge has been um, navigating spaces that sometimes don't appreciate all of those dimensions or, um, or, or value all of those dimensions. And in particular, uh, trying to navigate spaces where higher levels of leadership um, are, you know, sort of viewed in a particular way and, um, and, and where what I bring doesn't necessarily match that higher level of leadership viewpoint, if, if that makes sense. So, for example, someone just, just yesterday was telling me about a conversation um, they had and with someone who said that, you know, if you're going to be in the C-suite, you have to look the part, look the part. Yeah. And so, right, and, and this is, no one said this to me, but, um, but I do believe that I have, you know, worked in, in environments where that has been an un, unspoken truth, right, where, where, where people are saying, in order to be elevated, you must look the part. And what I would, you know, sometimes think and, and, and you know, try to find a way to say is that I, I don't look the part. And I'm probably not ever going to look the part because um, unless we, until we make more progress than we have today, right? Mm -hmm. Um, We we all know that people in higher levels of leadership um, typically fit a certain mold and it is a little bit monolithic still Mm -hmm. this day and age. And so um, my greatest challenge has really been navigating that not losing my um, my vigor and my zeal as I navigate it because sometimes it is um, it's difficult, but um, but I think I also have found ways uh, to to really you know hire my boss and and put myself in rooms with people who appreciate you know every dimension of, of uh, that I bring and see the value that those add to a leadership team. Um, and so trying to make sure that I am, um, I don't wanna say that I'm like, my therapy is, uh, is avoidance, but in some, in, some, in some ways, you know, I do have to just acknowledge that certain leaders and certain rooms might not ever value all of the dimensions that I bring. And that is just hard stop. And so I am going to find my way to rooms that really do appreciate, um, you know, all of the, all of what I bring to the table. Yeah. I mean, women definitely do have a lot of double-edged swords to have to navigate. And I think that's only compounded for women of color. Um, But at the same time, I mean, it sounds like one of the keys to your success has been being unabashedly yourself and, you know, being authentic and not playing the role or having to look the part, but being true to yourself. And so, I mean, what advice would you have to women about this idea of being authentic and staying true to who you are while, while still, you know, being able to be successful? Yeah, I, um, I, like all of you, I'm sure I have a few mentees and one of my, if you can have a favorite mentee, I shouldn't say this, but um, Alasia Brown, an amazing young woman who is one of my mentees, asked me this question. It had to be three years ago. And I looked at her and I said, Alasia, how can you ever achieve all that you want to achieve in your life? How can you ever fully arrive, right, in your, um, in your gifts, if you're not being who you were made to be. Like, I just, you know, I think that we are all um, gifted and with, with something that is unique, 
right, that we were designed to bring into the world. And so in order to get there fully, you have to just be who you are. I mean, that is that I, I believe that so wholeheartedly. And um, and so, you know, I, I mean, that, that is some that's somewhat of a mindset, Patricia, right? Like it it's it some it is somewhat of a mindset and a promise to, to yourself, to myself. Um <clears throat> But I think that I have learned that um, because I was really fortunate um, at, at a really impressionable, at, at a few very impressionable moments in my career to um, work underneath leaders who truly valued everything that I bring. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, and, and who who wouldn't let me, you know, sit in the room and be quiet. Right. They would they they would say, well, Disha, every time the meeting ends, you have all this stuff to say. Why didn't you say it in the meeting? Uh -huh. um, and so or they would or or I would show up as I am and with my loud laugh and with all of my ideas. And before I knew it, I was being promoted. I mean, so I, I, I had a, a really um, for, have, have had very fortunate experiences working with a, a handful of leaders who truly value what I bring. And once you're there and can be, you know, just exactly who you were made to be, I don't think there's any turning back. And so for me, that's sort of my experience, right? Um, I'm just kind of, I'm not going to turn back. But I also, I also, if you can't tell them, somebody who just like was probably born with a pretty hefty dose of confidence, um, <laughs> Sometimes I have I have stumbled into you know how to just be my authentic self and 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 it's you know sometimes it's like not reading too deep into people's bios so that I'm not intimidated when I show up in the, in the room. Mm -hmm. I might just read the first two paragraphs instead of reading all of them, right? <laughs> um, because I want to I want to just treat them as I would everybody else, and I want them to treat me the same. Um, so I've got a few little tricks like that that I've uh, that I've learned you know, over the years to really just um, not uh, get into my head and, and to be able to just say, you know what, I come as I am. Um, I think I'm smart. I, you know, I think I, I work really hard and, um, and I've got a whole lot of um, perspective that uh, I believe is valuable and, and including my lived experience, by the way, right? And so I just try to just show up and bring all of that and hopefully, you know, other people People will do the same and that is when you get to inclusive thought and man the work is much more fun and the impact is is higher I believe when we all can show up as we are yeah I mean I think definitely the more comfortable you are with who you are other people just experience you differently I, I kind of feel like I've, I've seen that and so I would think that you being unabashedly yourself really um you know, this is who I am, probably helps people to connect in a different way. Um, yeah. And yeah. let me just say, Patricia, for young people, I often will r remind them that it, it's, it, you know, it's about being <laughs> who you are unabashedly, your authentic self, but the most professional version of your, we're right. talking about right. work at the end of the day, right? right. And so right. as I, how I show up with my children um, <laughs> may not be how I show up, you know, in the office, but that doesn't mean that I'm, I'm being inauthentic. It just means that I am bringing you the professional version of my authentic self today, right? Um, and so I think that's important. Yeah, definitely. I was listening to a podcast yesterday where they were making the point that being your authentic self, you still have to think about the impact that you're having on other people. And so you can still share your authentic thoughts in a way that's constructive, that isn't going to put people on their heels or, you know, have them responding more to how you said it than what you said it. Right. Yeah. That's right. That's that's right. Yeah. So, um, you know, you said you weren't going to name drop, but, you know, in our <laughs> conversation, you did some name dropping, not asking you to do it today. But I mean, you really have cultivated a network that's really enviable and having some mentors that, you know, are really notable. Um, and, you know, I think for a lot of people, this idea of establishing a network and having mentors is something that they don't know how to do or they struggle with. Um, so how have you personally been able to do that for yourself? So that's a great question. So I, you know, grew up in the, I, I was born in the 70s, 
graduated high school in the 90s. And I think I told you this, Patricia. Um, for those who are like me, um, one of the things that was like commonplace was at the end of the school year, you know, in your yearbook, when you were signing your friend's yearbook, you would write your message, you know, I hope you have a great summer. And then you would sign it K-I-T. Um, and that stood for keep in touch, right? And then I would write my name. And so K keeping in touch is, is K-I-T is really just like what I do. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> and I would say, I mean, it's important to know, and I don't know what, what people do professionally um, in, that are in the room here today, but, um, you know, I, I'm in communication. So professionally, I end up being in rooms with, you know, amazing leaders, um, and I'm, and we are solving problems together. Like that, that is part of what I do, right? Um, at at some point when I was at Walmart, I, for example, I led crisis communications. I led communications for the financials and mergers and acquisitions and things in litigation. At some point, and so you know that puts you in a room with people really having to think hard about how you proactively do something um, and 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 meet an objective, or how you reactively um, protect the brand. And so I know for me that I build my best relationships through the work. When I we're, we're, when we're in there together and we have rolled up our sleeves and we are solving a problem, oh my gosh, like we get, I, I, we'll, I'll learn about your family, you know, through that process. I'll learn about you through the process. You'll learn about me. And then after that, I simply keep in touch, right? Um, you know, we all move off a project. You know, you've moved off of a project and it's like you never see the person again, right? right. But right. instead of allowing that to happen, I keep in touch. I'll, I will follow up and, and ask, just check in and see how you're doing. If I notice an article that I think you would be interested in because of this experience we've had together, I'll send it along to you. Um, and then if I feel like you have you could have some perspective as I'm trying to navigate a challenge in my career, I don't hesitate to call people up. I mean, mm -hmm. I just don't. Mm -hmm. um, but it, but that's not the only time I reach out, right? Like I keep in touch otherwise. Um, so I, for for me, that's been the important um, aspect of really nurturing relationships, and that leads to really awesome mentor mentee relationships. So, um, Patricia, so so as an example, I mean that that's how Roz Brewer and I got to know each other really well. We both worked at at Walmart. We we worked through a couple of problems together, and you know when I. I, I kept in touch when I was trying to navigate things personally, either per, in, in my career, even with my children, because mm. Roz is a working mom as well. You know, I would reach out and just say, hey, do you have like five minutes? This, you know, and I don't reach out every week, but if right. it's something that is significant, I don't hesitate to reach out. And I do think that oftentimes women, um, at least those in my network who I know, we get real shy about, yeah. you know, about reaching out. We assume that people are really busy. We get very, um, to, to the point I made earlier about like not reading too deep in the bio, we get real intimidated by the titles and the bios and who they are. Um, and we think that we're not worthy of this relationship or we're not worthy of, you know, of, of, of reaching out and, and having that kind of, of, of mentorship. But actually, like, who's to say you're not worthy, right? Right. Um, and in my experience working with a number of CEOs, um, actually they, and Roz will even say this just as to stay with that one example, they, she learns from our interactions. It helps her understand what people in her organization who maybe are at my career level may be grappling with. You know, it helps her understand perhaps where people who are people managers in her organization may be struggling or missing the mark um, as it relates to helping, um, you know, folks at, at my career stage navigate the next step and all of these kinds of things. So these things are two-way. Um, it's not just a, I am asking you a question and I am using you as a mentor, but we are, you know, we are in this together and both learning um, mutually. That makes a lot of sense. And, you know, as a coach dealing with really senior people, um, they are human, you know, and I think That's sometimes right. they forget that behind the bio and, you know, they probably go home and put on their sweatpants just like I do. You know, they might be 
designer sweatpants, but they're still <laughs> sweatpants. Or not. You never know. Yeah, right? That's true. That's true. But, you know, yeah, at, at the core, we all are human. Um, so I want to switch gears a little bit because, you know, you have your PR background. And something that I hear from a lot of professional women is how do I market myself professionally? You know, what's my personal brand? How do I let others know what I'm doing in the organization so that I can really get you know, the credit that I deserve. Um, and since you've clearly been really exceptional at doing that, you know, what advice would you have for women? Oh gosh, I don't know that I think I'm exceptional at it, but um, I, I, talk, I talk about this with my, um, my colleagues that work in my team at the chamber often. Um, I think that I think about how to, um, you know, sort of, package, if you will, <clears throat> results and impact. Um, because I learned to do that for clients very early in my career, we would talk about merchandising your results, right? Mm -hmm. So if you were my client, Patricia, you know, I've got a statement of work, I deliver all of the deliverables, and we have now emailed a bunch, you know, over the course of several months, and we're done, the project is done we would not stop there. We would then come back and package it up on one sheet of paper in a beautiful way so that you could actually see the many months of impact and the, and, and the, the roll up <clears throat> of what we were able to help you achieve. And so <clears throat> I do think about, I think that just even thinking about that as someone just put it in the comments, as merchandising your results yeah, um, is, 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 is smart. And, 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 and I think I think it actually <clears throat> simplifies it <clears throat> in a way, right? Um, <clears throat> you just realize that you're not having to, this is, it's not about like, you know, faking it until you make it or projecting something that you're not. Um, it just simply is about how do you merchandise your results? So I don't know, um, again, I'm not saying I'm an expert in this guys. Like I, we, we all can, you know, figure this out together. But um, if anybody follows me on LinkedIn, I, I tell young people all the time that my LinkedIn is, is an extension of my resume, right? In my head. Um, and so the things that I post on LinkedIn um, will be re related to, you know, the things, who I am professionally and what I am really good at or what I aspire, right, to, to be good at. Um, but I often am posting sort of things that, again, I'm, I merchandise my results on, on LinkedIn. And, and sometimes it's me thanking my team for having a really big impact on a particular thing or thanking another leader for allowing us to have a really big impact on a thing. But it truly is, for me, that, that's where I focus. I, I don't, I mean, I, and I know that, you know, some of the, some of the things, women especially, we want to focus on our look and, um, and the headshots and trying to make sure, I mean, I just had my husband take more, more pictures of me last night, Lord knows. <laughs> so, um, you know, I think that those things are important um, as well. But at the end of the day, I really do think it's about how do you merchandise your results um, in a way that speaks to your story, either where you are currently or where you want to, where you want to go. Okay. So I guess um, do good work and then, you know, don't let it stop there. Listen, let that's a prerequisite for all yeah. of this, y'all. Yeah. Like, I mean, you know, you have to be, you have to strive for excellence and um and try to be as 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 exceptional as you possibly can in and what you do for a living. I mean, that that just and and be a student of it always mm -hmm. and always working to improve. I compete with myself on a daily basis, mm -hmm. right? Like I'm trying to be better than I was yesterday or better than I. I did the last time, um, continuous improvement as a mindset. I mean, all of these things are prerequisites for, um, for, you know, any of the stuff that we've talked about. And I agree with you, Susan, that excellence is not perfection. I talk to, talk to about that with my children all the time. Yeah. Striving for excellence does not mean that you were, you know, attempting to be perfect. It just means you're trying to do the very best job that you can um, on every day. So um, I want to ask one more question because I want to make sure that people in the audience have a chance to ask questions. Um, but
but you know, we've seen that you're a mom to two sons and you know, you're a wife, you mentioned, how do you find balance with it all? Cause you are <laughs> a lot. Yeah. Um, how do I find, I, you know, I, it's striving for excellence. I mean, that's just the, you know, I, I want to be great at, you know, at my roles at home. I want to be an amazing mom. I want to be a wonderful wife. I want to be a really good friend, you know, to my girlfriends and my guy friends. And I also want to be a really good sister to my brother. I mean, like, you know, we all have all of these roles and dimensions. Yeah. And so I think, you know, again, I believe really in, in your mindset being critical as a first step. But so I know that in my mind and in my heart, I want to do a really good job in all of those areas of my life and I'm committed to that um what I also know is that on some days I'm better at work than I am at being a wife and on some days I am a better friend than I was a colleague right okay. um and so I give myself grace <clears throat> across the board. Mm -hmm. um, I think resources are very important. If you are, you know, so blessed to be able to pay people to kind of come in and help you, if you can't do that, but you've got friends and family around you, I I am not hesitant. I don't hesitate to ask for support and help. That's been really challenging, by the way, in the pandemic, because, mm -hmm. you know, you don't, you, we've just sort of stayed in our family unit because of COVID. But, um, but yeah, I mean, I think that, that resources and thinking about resources in a, in the broadest way and, and, and being willing to ask people to, to jump in and give grace or jump in and help me um, from time to time is also very important. I have a really supportive family. You know, my husband is amazing. My friends, I mean, they cheer me on and would do anything to help me um, be able to continue to achieve professionally. And so I feel very blessed and fortunate by all of that. But, um, but yeah, it's just about, you know, for me, it's about the commitment and um, and the desire to want to do a good job in all of those areas of my life. I think because I'm committed, I work on it every single day. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like a theme for you, you know, at work and at home is just having a community or, you know, not being afraid to ask for help if you need it or for advice or for first perspective. And yeah, and I'll tell you, Patricia, one of the things that has really been um, helpful to me also is is encouraging my children's independence, right? Mm -hmm. And so I do all kind of crazy things like, you know, for both of my boys to be able to like get their own breakfast in the morning. You know, mm -hmm. we, we, I bought one of those like hotel cereal dispensers oh, nice. so that like they, I put the, the milk in a smaller container so they, and it's at their eye level so they can come down and get, the bowls are reachable, right? They, they know what we practice all of these things. Um, my, my eight year old, you know, can make his own lunch, you know, all of th those kind of things, I think, by the way, help me be able to like take a load off a little bit, but they also are encouraging my children um, to be independent and, and to learn, you know, how to take care of themselves. And so I, there are all kinds of things I think that we can um, do, all sorts of tricks that we can try, you know, as we're trying to get to balance. Well, I would think it would also make them good partners when they're older, because, um, they will know that they have a role to play around the house too. And that's right. That's, that's right. right. Yeah. Well, I want to open up the floor to questions. And um, I think Anne's going to be rejoining us to facilitate that part. So yes. yes. Yeah. Hey, thank you, Disha. One of the, there's a lot of takeaways from today's discussion. Um, but one of the ones that I loved so much was uh, Kit, keep in touch. Yes. I love that. So short, easy to remember and uh, really confidence boosting. So thank you for that. Good, good. So one of our listeners had posed an earlier question and you sort of, you sort of answered it. However, she was looking for tips to navigate those situations where your, you know, your diversity or your uniqueness is not valued. And so I'm curious, it, without divulging any kind of situational details, can you talk a little bit about how, what does that look like when, when you're yeah. in a situation, a meeting, for example, or something like that? 
Yes. So, yeah. And, and, I, and I'm, I can absolutely speak to this without d- divulging or sharing anything that I think is inappropriate. I, I, for me, um, and it really boils down to courage, right? And we know, I mean, we, have, we, are, we study leadership. And so we know that courage is critical, right? It is, it is just something that we have to have as leaders in general. And so um, I have found the courage on a number of occasions to speak truth to power and, and to, to let people know how either something that was said, you know, has made me feel or, um, or when I feel like something I have, you know, tried to add has either been misinterpreted or devalued, mm. right? Um, and I don't do that in, a, in, the, in the boardroom, you know, with, you know, 20, 50, hundreds of other people around. But I think finding the opportunity to have a one-on-one conversation um, is always important in the most challenging scenarios. I believe in having those conversations over food, <laughs> getting people out of you know your sort of classic uh, office space and and get into a neutral space and having some food involved um, sometimes helps. It's at least been helpful in my situations. Um, but I think so. So having the one on one conversations, and sometimes that is either with the person who has made the you know transgression, if you will, or it's with my boss. Right. And, and or with the people who I need to be to be my allies in the work in the workplace. Um, I have actually called on people to be my allies. Like I have said, hey, um, there has been a a pattern in these in these meetings where I am the only person who is raising this point or these kinds of points. And, um, and, 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 and it, it's not always well received. I need someone else to be thinking about these kinds of topics as well and perhaps raising them. Or if I raise the point, can you come behind me, right? And say, hey, that was a great point. So I, you know, I have, these are all kinds of, in this, it depends on the scenario, but I think that, um, you know, for me, those are strategies that ha- that I have tried to um, implement that have worked in, in many cases. And let me just say this, um, for me at this career stage, I say this, publicly and all the time, I am, I hire my boss. So where, where I am in my career stage, I, I am very fortunate and privileged to be able to say, I'm going to go and work for a leader or work in, in, in a culture that actually values me. And I sort of, I probe for that in the process, you know, and, and in some cases I decide, nope, they're not ready for Disha, <laughs> um, right? And, and in other cases I decide, oh my gosh, like they really would enjoy having me there. And by the way, I can also add a whole lot to their environment, um, you know? And so I think there will be times where you have to decide that it's not for you. They're not, they're not ready for all of the dimensions that you bring. Um, or, and you might be in that scenario today and you might need to, fit, you know, you've, you've tried all of the things and you are like, you know what? It's actually becoming toxic. And the better thing for me to do is to try to navigate my way out of this situation into something that may be better. And so, you know, I, yeah, I'm going on and on. Now, this is whoever asked that question, <clears throat> call me. We can talk <laughs> to, um, to brainstorm and to get into some more specifics. Sincerely, I mean, sincerely, send me a direct message in here and I will give you my email. Very nice. mm, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah I, I know uh, that when um, we're not able to live our authentic selves, life gets <clears throat> real clunky and messy. And so it's better. I love your um, uh, your characterization of hiring your boss because it's true. You do hire the organization as much as they're hiring you, and you better make sure there's a good fit there, uh, culturally speaking, before you get. Yeah. To Unless, and in some in some cases, we do have to blaze trails. So let's let's just let us not forget that, right? And so there there will be scenarios. If you if you've got the stamina and the muscle for it, 
where you got to go into an organization and, and it's on you to make a difference for someone else. And I have, I have, you know, kind of raised my hand for those kind of opportunities in my career as well. It's not easy, but, um, but that's when, you know, again, I think about the moments that have made me most proud. It's when I have, you know, blazed the trail and, and gotten an organization to some degree of transformation and culture shift that creates a better space for others to be able to bring their authentic selves to work as well. Mm -hmm. So it goes beyond influencing strategies to actually transformational kinds of uh, change. Yes. Uh, that's great. So uh, listeners, please enter your questions into the chat area. And uh, so we've only got a couple more minutes left uh, with Disha and uh, which has been amazing. Thank you so much. I'm so glad that you got the boys into school and were able to join us. Uh, so I, I noticed, by the way, that there was a quote I entered into the chat by Julie that's what I love. Be yourself. Everyone else is taken by Oscar that's Wilde. Right. Uh, she was reminded in your conversation about that particular quote. I thought that was great. And uh, Susan Hitchcock said, you are confidence and authenticity personified. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you very much. And, you know, and, I, and I, I will say, I think a lot of people have learned to sort of be this way. And, 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 I, and I think that that is the case for me, too, right? Um, I, again, I go back to when I was, you know, an intern and afraid to speak up in a room, right? Um, so I, I, I often go back to that moment and think specifically about the leader who, who said to me, don't do that again, right? Like, if you've got a thought, you raise it yeah. um, and, and raise it when the client is there, when everybody is there, don't just pull me to the side after and give me your 20 ideas, right? And so I think um, that was freeing. Uh, for me. And, and I, I think that we should think about how we can either free ourselves and also free others um, in that way. So Mary Wheatley has said, how do you approach providing feedback when you're not feeling supported without harming the relationship? Yeah, um, that's a tough one. I mean, I think that, you know, um, relationships matter. I think oftentimes too, in particular, I will just say as people of color, when you're having to give feedback in corporate, corporate spaces, you have fear of retaliation. I mean, there's all kinds of things, right, that come into your mind. And so that's why I, I started with courage, you know, and so how do I approach it? I, I think I just sort of spoke to it. It's one-on-one. -on -one. Um, because I'm, I, I'm a communications person at heart, I actually think through my talking points, right? So I think about, you know, exactly what do I want to convey? Um, I believe in adding some storytelling, right? So I give really specific, as an example, when this, when this happened, and I share a, a really specific example. Um, and then I try to just be solution-oriented, too. So I don't, you know in partnership. So we, we, I would like for us to solve this together. Um, here are some ideas that I had about, you know, ways that we can, you know, kind of get to a better relationship and improve, you know, our working together as colleagues over time. What ideas do you have, right? And, mm -hmm. and again, I'm not going to say that that approach has always worked every single time um, because people will be defensive. And, and so sometimes you, you, you might start the conversation by saying, this is going to be a tough conversation for me and for you. I mean, it's, I'm, I'm, I don't enjoy this, but I think it's important that we have this dialogue, right? Um, and maybe you got to break it out into more than one conversation. So, I mean, sometimes I'm like, poke me in the eye, but, you know, because nobody really enjoys having tough, tough conversations. But I do think that that's, you know, sometimes that works better. Well, let's talk about this now. Maybe we can both think about it and come back and have a, have a, another discussion after we sort of let it sit, sit with us for a minute. So um, yeah, those are some of the things that have worked for me. My, our HR person teases me and says that I, I talk like I was in HR at some point in my career. I was not, but, um, but I do, you know, I, for a living, you, I, I believe in 
communication that is Im impactful, that reaches the intended audience and has the impact that you want it to have. And so I do think that we have to be thoughtful about these things, even when one-on-one. -on -one. Yes, I used to have a, or a colleague that used to say to me, never go into a meeting empty-headed. <laughs> so planning it ahead, great advice. Well, we'll have to end the Q&A there, uh, but please stay tuned to, uh, to our listeners. Please stay tuned because Disha will have the last word in just a moment. Uh, but I want to bring everybody up to date as to what's going on at TurkNet for just a minute. Um, so the first thing that I want to bring to your attention is that uh, we just began a podcast series, or I did, uh, called Women of Character brand new podcast series, and our first one has been released. Um, but this is intended to feature women of character who have in some way beat the odds in how they've achieved what they've achieved. And so it's been an interesting, interesting journey of, of uh, interviewing several women who are in that category. Our first episode, uh, I'm joined by Marcy Taylor, who is the CEO uh, and president of the Bennett International Group, a female owned trucking company. And uh, so she beat the odds at the age of 19 with three children, packed the car up, moved to Atlanta, ended up buying a trucking company and grew it from just a handful of employees to over 5,000, 6,000 uh, and uh, 12 different companies. So interesting, interesting. But she's now um, has to uh, pass on the culture that she's built. So she's brought on her daughter, I mean, sorry, her granddaughter, Caitlin folks. And so she's also a guest of ours on this podcast as the culture ambassador. And, and so listen in to this one as uh, they talk about how they're uh, trying to sustain this award-winning culture of character. So that's the podcast series and there'll be many more to come. The other thing that I wanted to bring to your attention is that our next Women in Leadership uh, series will feature uh, Vicki Kanzler, who is the Senior Vice President and Chief People Officer of the P Piedmont Healthcare System. And her uh, topic is building great teams, leading large transitions, and there's been quite a few of those there, and battling a pandemic all in a day's work. So since 2013, she has overseen a major growth from 8,500 to over 23,000 team members. So close to a, what, a 300% increase almost. So you throw in COVID-19, a major stressor to every healthcare system, as you can imagine, and it could be a perfect storm. So I'm looking forward to our conversation on May 28th, and we hope you are too. The other thing we wanted to bring to your attention is that uh, TurkNet has a new offering. We're offering a fully valid survey instrument to organizations that might be interested in measuring employees' attitudes towards diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, it's been proven useful to building and, and or sustaining a culture that embraces diversity, equity, and inclusion. And uh, so the survey can be administered to either the entire organization or only to a targeted area like the company's divisions. So for more information, reach out to Tino, our CEO and president, and the contact information is there. Finally, get social. Um, check in with us, uh, connect with us via our website, uh, Twitter, uh, join our groups on LinkedIn or Facebook, and certainly check us out on YouTube. And certainly, finally, subscribe to our monthly newsletter if you're so inclined. So a lot of information in, in all of those. And there's our contact information if you want more information on any of the, what I've mentioned. So with that, Patricia, I'll turn it back over to you as we give uh, Disha the last word. Yeah, so we end all of our interviews with this question, which is, what is the one thing that you would like to leave for those listening? Yeah, I, so I, this has been my my takeaway for myself and um, and for others. Whenever I've been asked this question over recent months, um, I just I think we just have to take up space. You know, for me that that has been my um, my affirmation and my mantra that I have tried to try to live um, over the past uh, again maybe the past year and a half. Um, I really want to encourage women in particular 
to take up space, play big. You know, we have ideas, solutions, questions, um, challenges um, that we want to bring forward in our um, work environments that I think um, are critical for, for organizations and their success. And sometimes we decide to play small. Sometimes we decide to shrink ourselves. Um, sometimes we just decide to hold in the thought and not share it because we think it won't be valued. But instead of doing any of that, I just will encourage people to play big and take up space. Um, you know, I think our organizations and our world, frankly, will be better when more women decide to do that. Awesome. Thank you so much. Those are wise words. And, you know, in the opening, I said that I felt like we would all be educated and inspired as a result of listening to you. And from the raving comments I see, I think that everybody definitely had that experience. So I just want to thank you so much again for joining us this morning. I, I found it to be amazing. I think everyone else did too. Um, and to everyone listening, you know, we will see you again next month. And I hope you all have a great weekend. Thank you. Thank you all. Okay, bye.